Hello, uh, I'm Christopher Filson. I'm a urologist and cancer surgeon who treats patients at Winship Cancer Institute. And I'm Sagar Patel, a radiation oncologist at Winship. So as you may know, June is Men's Health Awareness Month. So Dr. Filson and I would like to talk to you about the second leading cause of cancer death in American men, prostate cancer. So one out of every men, one out of every nine men in the U.S. will be diagnosed with prostate cancer during his life. So over the next 15 or so minutes, we're going to talk to you about diagnosis and treatment options, as well as the importance of screening and prevention. We're also happy to take any questions that you may have in the comment section below. So Dr. Phillison, from your perspective, can you describe to our viewer, viewers what is prostate cancer and how many people are diagnosed each year? Well, the prostate gland is a sexual organ uh, that lives next to the bladder. And basically, um, for many United States, there's an estimated 192,000 cases that will be diagnosed in 2020. And in the state of Georgia specifically, we estimate there's going to be just under 7,000 new cases diagnosed. Um, and it's important to kind of know how prostate cancer uh, presents itself. Uh, Dr. Patel, what, what would you say are some typical signs and symptoms of, of prostate cancer? Yeah, well, one of the unique features of prostate cancer compared to other types of cancers like breast or lung or colon is that there usually aren't any warning signs or symptoms, which can be a bit scary. Um, there can be a tumor growing deep within the prostate gland that may not be pushing on any structures that could cause pain. I think in exceedingly rare cases, Patients may present with certain symptoms due to the tumor growing in the gland. These symptoms may be urinary changes, specifically frequency, urgency, waking up at night to pee or um, poor stream. Some patients may present with erectile dysfunction due to the tumor growing into the nerves and blood supply that um, are used for erections. Some patients may present with blood in the semen or urine or with some pain and pressure in the rectum. But it's important for viewers to know that these symptoms are exceedingly rare and most patients are asymptomatic. And in fact, a lot of these symptoms I uh, described, especially the urinary and erectile ones, are quite common in the U.S. and as men get older. So having these symptoms don't necessarily mean you are harboring cancer. But I think having any symptoms, especially those that are worsening, warrants a discussion with your doctors to see if you do need any particular workup or if they're due to more common benign causes. So off that, Dr. Filson, what are the risk factors from your mind for prostate cancer? And in particular, what role does family history play? That's a great question. So, so really, there's three factors that come into play in terms of increasing risk for a man uh, developing or having prostate cancer. And those three are age, race, and as you mentioned, family history. In terms of age, we know that as men get older, their risk for having prostate cancer increases. Um, so that's why when we talk about screening for prostate cancer, as we'll discuss later, uh, that need increases as men get older. Um, so younger men, younger than 40, don't need to consider screening for prostate cancer. But as time goes on, as, as men get older, they may need to consider um, getting screened. Um, the second factor that I mentioned was, was patient race. And specifically, uh, we know that black men have a, a higher risk of developing and being diagnosed with prostate cancer. And also among black men who get diagnosed with prostate cancer, there's a, a, um, poor outcomes when it relates to how uh, long men survive after that diagnosis. Uh, finally, uh, as you mentioned before, family history. Now, traditionally, we focused upon a uh, patient's family history of prostate cancer in first degree relatives, be it father or brothers, um, and which is critical. I think not only understanding family history in terms of number of family members, but also how young they were and whether they had aggressive prostate cancer is key for, for patients to know. But increasingly, we've also understood that there are other cancers that we should con consider uh, when we talk about family history and its increasing risk as it relates to prostate cancer. And the ones in mind are breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and colon cancer, because we know now that there's some genetic syndromes, uh, specifically with gene mutations of like BRCA1 and BRCA2, which may confer an elevated risk for prostate cancer. And for men with those types of mutations, they may need to consider getting screened for prostate cancer uh, at a younger age. So those are the, the overall main risk factors as it, as it pertains to prostate cancer in general. Um, so 
We talked about risk factors. Let's talk about treatment options. Dr. Patel, what can you tell us about some of the advanced radiation treatment options that we offer at Winship Cancer Institute? So generally taking a step back for prostate cancer, there's three main uh, umbrellas of treatment. One is a approach called active surveillance. Another is a surgical approach. And I'll let you kind of go into details about those two. And the last is radiation. So radiation is the strategic use of ionizing radiation to kill cancer cells. We're able to use the technology to preferentially kill cancer cells while maximally sparing normal tissue. And radiation, like surgery, is very effective at killing localized or even locally advanced prostate cancer and, and has been shown to have the same cure rates as surgery. So in terms of types of radiation, there's a slew of, of modalities and types. And at Winship, we are actually able to provide the vast majority of types of radiation out there. And to, to give an overview, there's, there's two basic types of radiation therapy. There's an external form of treatment where we use a machine to produce radiation beams that deliver through the patient's skin into the prostate. That's what we call external beam radiation therapy. And then there's internal radiation therapy, or what we term brachytherapy, which, is, which involves the internal implantation of a radiation source into the prostate. So in terms of external beam radiation therapy, there's two main types. There's IMRT, intensity modulated radiation therapy, which is a photon-based therapy or high energy x-rays. This is the type of radiation that is most commonly utilized across the country. It's an effective form of treatment that is able to deliver radiation conformally around the prostate and uh, provide minimal side effects um, while effectively treating the cancer. The newer technology, which we do have available at Winship, is proton beam therapy. So protons is radiation, but it's a, a slightly different form of delivery. It's a particle-based delivery method where we use protons from an atom, um, and we're able to deliver those uh, in, that converge onto the prostate. Protons offer the advantage of providing slightly more tissue sparing because it's a little bit more precise. It causes less scatter radiation dose to the pelvis. There's a lot of studies out there that's trying to investigate how beneficial is protons or whether, whether it is beneficial. Winship is actively participating in those trials and we are actively treating many men with prostate cancer with proton therapy. Now in terms of internal radiation or brachytherapy, there's also two main types. There's the more traditional form called radioactive seeds that involves the implantation of permanent pellets into the prostate, which over one or two months will slowly dissipate and treat the prostate. At Emory, we actually have a slightly newer technology of this that is basically temporary seeds. And the formal name is high dose rate brachytherapy or HDR brachytherapy. This is a similar technique, except as an outpatient, uh, radiation oncologists in conjunction with the urologist place the radioact radioactive source into the prostate. And after 20 to 25 minutes of treatment, we remove that source. So patients are able to walk out of the clinic with nothing left in their prostate. So it's been advancing option as patients don't have to have precautions when they leave the hospital setting in terms of being radioactive to young children or their partners. So those are the few of the options that we provide. Now, one of the options that has been emerging, especially amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, is stereotactic body radiotherapy. So our goal as radiation oncologists during this time is trying to minimize patient exposure to the healthcare setting. And traditionally with radiation, that can be difficult because a lot of our treatments may be weeks, five days a week. And that's a lot of opportunity for exposing to this virus. Fortunately at Emory, we have the most advanced delivery platforms with image guidance to where we're able to truncate our treatments to as little as five treatments with the same efficacy and with the same toxicity as the most prolonged versions. So the option of stereotactic body radiation therapy has also been an acquiring option that we're delivering in our department. So as I mentioned, the other two main options in addition to radiation are active, active surveillance and surgery. So Dr. Fosen, can you touch on the latest surgical options and also mention your perspective of active, active surveillance? Absolutely. So, um, you know, when we talk about surgery, quote unquote surgery for a patient with prostate cancer, traditionally, and I think most commonly that refers to a procedure called a radical prostatectomy, which is the medical term for removing the entire prostate along with seminal vesicles, which are attached to the prostate, as well as some 
oftentimes lymph nodes that live near the prostate and the pelvis. That's an operation that long ago was done through a large incision that involved significant blood loss, a, a couple day, few days stay in the hospital and, and uh, a tough recovery over the, of the subsequent weeks. More recently, we've um, kind of honed our ability to do this in a new way, which is called the robotic assisted minimally invasive radical prostatectomy, which is the same procedure that's done through small keyhole incisions that offers just an overnight stay in the hospital and a quicker recovery with less blood loss and patients feeling kind of back to normal in, in a quicker fashion with similar cancer related outcomes and uh, um, something that patients feel like is the better option. Um, similar to what Dr. Patel said, that this is a treatment option that offers a overnight stay in the hospital so that their treatment can be delivered in a short amount of time, which is particularly pertinent in the COVID-19 era. Um, so that's one uh, treatment modality that we offer here. In addition to that, we have newer technologies that may be a little bit more focused, more refined uh, for kind of targeting and focally treating patients with, uh, with, with less aggressive prostate cancer should they need treatment. Specifically, cryotherapy, which is a freezing therapy of the prostate, as well as focal laser therapy, which can treat specific areas in the prostate where the cancer lives, leaving behind the other areas of the normal prostate. Um, and those therapies, although they haven't been around for quite as long, may offer good cancer-related uh, outcomes while maintaining a patient's quality of life and minimizing side effects um, after treatment. Um, but ultimately, for most for many patients with, with prostate cancers, they don't have aggressive tumors. And we realize that the best way to avoid all the downsides of treatment is trying to avoid or at least delay aggressive treatment while maintaining the opportunity for their cancer to be cured if necessary. And that's using a, um, a, a management strategy called active surveillance. It's not passive, it's not us turning our back on a patient and their cancer. It's us being vigilant and monitoring things closely with things like biopsies, MRI, and PSA testing to ensure that things aren't changing over time, to ensure that if something does change, we can still cure a patient, and to make sure that men have adequate sexual and urinary function through their you know, prime years of life so that uh, you know, that quality of life is maintained with time. And, and we have a robust um, group of men here at Winship that we've been taking care of for months and years that are doing very well with that with that strategy. So it's uh, it's one that we uh, both on the radiation oncology and urology side share a viewpoint that it's it's often the best strategy for men who have less aggressive prostate tumors. Um, and uh, it's it's good that you know Dr. Patel and, and I and others within Winship um, uh, are aligned in in that belief. So um, related to surveillance and related to that monitoring, Dr. Patel, how would you? Uh, say, how important is that follow-up care after a man gets treated? So follow-up care is, is paramount. Um, it's uh, intimately a part of the treatment process is, itself. And, and there's two important aspects of follow-up care. One is the treatment-related aspect, and the other one is the cancer-related. So in terms of the treatment-related, we as providers, urologists and radiation oncologists, want to track the side effects that we impose due to our treatments. Now, these may be urinary, they may be bowel, they may be sexual. But in some way, you, are going, you may experience uh, one of these three side effects due to treatment. And a part of our surveillance is monitoring those treatments and offering uh, a management, whether it's medical or minimally invasive procedures, to help alleviate those symptoms. So that's one key component. The other one, of course, is the cancer-related component of surveillance. After treatment, we want to ensure that the cancer has responded appropriately and that you remain in remission uh, for the long term. And we do that by blood test to measure the PSA. And that can be done every three to six months for the short term. And eventually we space it out to be annual test. But that's a very important component to make sure that our treatment worked and that the cancer has stayed um, out of the body through that time. Now, amidst all this post-treatment surveillance can be an overwhelming process, dealing with the side effects, dealing with the anxiety if the cancer will come back. And fortunately at Winship, we do offer several support structures and groups to help with this, um, whether it be spiritual, nutrition, including a prostate-specific prostate group that meets monthly 
that can help patients through the recovery process and help uh, pay it forward by helping patients behind the line and having discussion to give advice on other patients who are just starting the process. And that's something that we have a, a robust group of men who participate in at Winship. So Dr. Phillison, um, going back to the screening, um, what are the best screening options for prostate cancer? This is a, a great and, and important question because um, you, you can often see kind of swirling controversy as it relates to prostate cancer screening um, with, with two sides of the debate about screening being too aggressive or not aggressive enough. Um, typically, what when we say screening for prostate cancer involves that test you mentioned, the, the PSA or prostate-specific antigen test, which is a blood test that uh, um, any man can get um, uh, annually to screen for prostate cancer. And the, the, one of the aspects of prostate cancer screening is, that's controversial is that, you know, uh, screening for prostate cancer, as I mentioned before, may lead to diagnosis of tumors that may not be aggressive, that may need to be monitored with time. But at the same time, there's a lot of evidence that suggests, although the, the benefit may be small broadly, it can uh, improve uh, the likelihood of living longer, and it, it can decrease the risk of cancer spreading to other parts of the body. So, so with that controversy of the pros and cons, all guidelines recommend that um, the decision to pursue screening for prostate cancer with a PSA test should be what's called a shared decision-making process. So uh, a man should talk to their either primary care physician or their windship provider and say, what are the pluses and minuses of getting a PSA test every year? On the one hand, there may be detection of a, of a cancer that would benefit from treatment. On the other hand, there may be some more testing, biopsies, and the potential risk of getting a diagnosis of a cancer that doesn't need treatment. And you have to weigh the, the pluses and minuses of those in context of the patient's health and age and other factors. So current guidelines say that um, the cons initial consideration for an average risk man should consider uh, PSA screening at the age of 45 to 50, depending on what guideline you read, and then continue to consider screening every year or every other year until they're early to mid 70s, again, depending on which guideline you read. And the important thing to consider is that men who have, say, a poor life expectancy due to other medical conditions or advanced age may not benefit from PSA testing because it may lead them down a road of getting poked with biopsies or even find a cancer that is unlikely to threaten their life and cause more harm than good. Um, but there's a sweet spot. And, and with, a, with an informed discussion, I think men should consider whether PSA screening is right for them and uh, consider whether they want to do it annually or every other year. And I think it's, it's key for us kind of continuing to fight the battle to, to prevent um, you know, advanced cases of prostate cancer and, and men dying from prostate cancer in this country. Um, so, um, so with that, uh, we, we appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to, um, to uh, uh, talk about prostate cancer today. Um, I think uh, it's key to, to know for men who have perhaps been recently diagnosed with prostate cancer or perhaps have had a recent PSA test that's a little abnormal, you know, we are here at Winship for you. And that if you would be interested in making an appointment, you know, it, sometimes it's scary for patients in the COVID-19 era to say, I don't want to go to the hospital. Like, you know, it's, it's, in, it's in Atlanta. There may be, you know, risks to me. Um, and all I can state is that, you know, um, Winship and Emory Healthcare have made great strides to ensure a safe experience for patients that are coming through our clinic um, to the point where we ensure social distancing, uses of masks, um, aggressive disinfecting, et cetera. So we're not going to bring patients into an environment that's, that's not safe. So, so that's the first thing I want to stress. And if, if somebody is interested with seeing um, one of our providers face-to-face -face or even having a televisit um, remotely by video, I'd recommend that you call 404-778-1900 to get in touch to make an appointment as it pertains to prostate cancer or PSA screening or anything else. Um, and we're, we're both here for you, uh, and, and we're happy to help in any way we can. Uh, and I appreciate the time. Thank you for joining us.